Murray Sabrin is a professor of finance at New Jersey's Ramapo College with a PhD in economic geography from Rutgers. He's written articles for all sorts of outlets, book after book, and he even has a long and somewhat storied career as a political candidate, bringing the heat to more mainstream politicians in their primary races. He joins us today to explore one basic, though definitely complicated, point. The Federal Reserve, over 100 years old and taken for granted by all, still sucks. All right, so Professor Sabrin, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, uh, let's see, I first heard your name back in the good old halcyon days of what we millennials at least call the first Ron Paul campaign. Even though I was born in 1988, the actual first Ron Paul campaign, to me, it's 2008, of course. And uh, I believe it was sometime in early, maybe mid-07, we all sort of got wind of this guy running for the Senate in New Jersey, stirring up a whole bunch of trouble for a certain political party by running in the primary yes. and really, really pushing them. Um, and I understand you've run again since then. And I'm wondering, how does all of your, and you, you had involvement before that, before that uh, first campaign I heard about. So how does your political experience come to bear on your job as an economist? Well, the thing is, uh, running as a candidate, you're trying to get common sense ideas about the economy, about the foreign policy about civil liberties when you're running for federal office uh, to the mainstream. So, uh, But running in a primary, it's very hard in New Jersey because it's so controlled by the bosses of each county. They have a huge impact on how you are positioned on the ballot in, uh, in the June primary and uh, whether you get support of, quote, the county. And that has a, a major effect on how many people know about you. Obviously, I attended uh, the debates in the Republican primary in 2008 uh, when I was running against three establishment candidates. And by the way, to give you some backdrop, initially it was only uh, Governor Whitman and I were in the primary, and then she dropped out. In uh, September of 2007, I declared my candidacy in early 2007, and, I, uh, uh, and, I, and she were the only ones in, and then she decided to drop out, which uh, was unfortunate because I thought it would have been a great matchup since I ran against her as a Libertarian Party candidate for governor in 1997 and made political history by becoming the first third party candidate to raise enough funds to get matching funds, which required me to be in three debates with the major party candidates. So I was looking forward to a one-on-one -on -one debate with uh, Governor Whitman about some of the issues, but she dropped out. And I was told by her uh, former campaign manager that in June of 2007, the um, Whitman campaign did a poll and showed that I had 35% of the vote. This was a year before the primary. So if we had had a one-on-one -on -one race, who knows what, have, what have, uh, would have happened in June of 2008. So needs to say that is uh, that never materialized and I didn't win the primary because establishment candidates came in to replace her and one of them won the primary. So uh, that was my experience as the um, I'm sorry, that was in 2000, in 2000, I take that back. In 2008, I also ran against establishment candidates, and um, one of the favorite candidates dropped out of the race, and um, uh, the Republican establishment s kept on seeking an establishment candidate to replace her, and they finally came up with a former congressman who won the nomination because he was getting the support of the county leaders. And I didn't make the uh, I didn't get the nomination that year. And then I ran again in 2014, uh, again again uh, against a, a low level field, so to speak, because none of them were establishment candidates. Uh, but um, from what I was told, uh, Governor Christie didn't want me to win that nomination. So uh, there's a lot of interesting um, intrigue about running <clears throat> as a libertarian Republican in uh, the uh, Republican primary in the state of New Jersey. But be that as it may, our ideas were getting out there. I was getting coverage. But the major coverage I got was in 97 when um, we were getting national coverage because we were the um, – there were only two gubernatorial campaigns in 1997, New York, and, uh, New Jersey, and Virginia. And I was talking about some of the major economic issues, taxes, spending, uh, and other issues, auto insurance. Uh, by the way, what I uh, concluded, given 
what I said during that campaign and what transpired later on is you don't have to win to get your ideas enacted. For example, I talked about auto deregulation, auto insurance deregulation. And you would think that a Republican governor would be in favor of deregulation, since that's the mantra of the Republican Party, less government involvement in the economy. So I talked about government deregulation of the auto insurance industry, and Whitman was opposed to it. Four years later, Jim McGreevy, who I ran against in 2000, in 1997, becomes governor, and what does he do? He deregulates the auto insurance market, basically along the plans that I uh, articulated in 1997. Uh, what was the other thing I campaigned on, which uh, is not a big issue, but it saved New Jerseyans a lot of money. I uh, supported a 65 speed limit. We had a 55 speed limit in the state of New Jersey. That means a lot of people were getting tickets on the Jersey Turnpike and the Garden State Parkway because those roads were made uh, for automobiles to go faster than 55. So after the election, uh, Whitman imposed the... Uh, got rid of the 55 speed limit on most of the major highways and we got a 65 speed limit, even though during the campaign she was opposed to raising the speed limit to 65. In addition, we struck a blow for free speech. In 97, I put a campaign uh, uh, banner or poster on my front lawn and I got a notice one day from a local police officer saying, you're in violation of section such and such that uh, your um, campaign sign is a violation of this ordinance. So our campaign went to court, and the judge threw, out, threw it out. It's part of case law that, as a property owner, you now can put a campaign lawn sign on your own property. So we struck a blow for the First Amendment in the first campaign in 1997. So basically, it's very hard to break through as a Republican libertarian with the establishment candidates, with the establishment um, uh, powers that be, because they're not interested in ideas. They're just interested in, in being one of the old Boys Club, and I was not part of the Boys Club. And then I ran as a Libertarian candidate for uh, U.S. Senate in 2018, and I criticized the incumbent uh, corrupt senator for his pro-war positions, his, uh, his uh, corruption, and the Republican candidate spent $36 million of his own money blanketing the airwaves, telling us how corrupt the uh, rep Democratic candidate was, and, and he didn't get any traction. I didn't get any traction because the media basically ignored my campaign. And, I, and there was only one debate to show you what a poor democracy we live in, especially in New Jersey. There was only one debate. I mean, how um, weak is that when you're trying to educate the voters and you cannot uh, have a robust debate of the issues between the candidates? And so um, we got virtually no coverage in the, the 2018 Senate campaign. But the bottom line is that's why I think my retirement uh, this year, July 1st, will allow me to do more and more writing. And every time I write an article for the local newspaper, at least 200,000 people read it, and hopefully more as it goes on various websites uh, throughout New Jersey and around the country. So I'm confident that uh, my mission after uh, I retire is to keep on fighting the good fight for um, uh, free market ideas, pro-civil liberties, anti-war, and that's the agenda the American people, I hope, embrace so we could have a more peaceful world, um, a more productive economy, and uh, a lower burden on, on uh, businesses and individuals in terms of taxes and regulation, which would mean that we have uh, continuous prosperity. And besides, with my book on the Federal Reserve, we can get back to a sound money regime so we don't have these crazy business cycles that are really destructive of people's um, income and wealth because uh, there are people still reeling from the last crash. You, you drive through uh, small town America and there are a lot of businesses closed up and uh, there are still pockets of unemployment. Uh, and so the, the point I would make is that despite all the things the Fed does that harms the economy, uh, entrepreneurs are still going to uh, create and invent and innovate. And that I think is the uh, strength of America, the American people are uh, not going to be uh, sidetracked by what the federal uh, government does, especially the Federal Reserve. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> you talking about your political career, I mean, you, you, you certainly have a, uh, a, a great vision that you outline there. Um, but it also sounds a bit like you're a glutton for punishment, you know? Uh, yeah, like, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I mean, I should have, after 2000, I should have stopped running in the Republican primary uh, <laughs> because uh, they just are not acceptant, accepting. Uh, 
the idea that someone should run who has a clear vision and a pro-free market approach because the Republican Party says they are all for free enterprise and limited government, but yet they support all the federal spending that's raising spending to record levels, increasing the budget deficit, and no one seems to care in Washington that uh, Republicans are in charge of the Senate and the White House, and they're running the most, uh, the biggest pro-big government government in our history. But it's it, it's also not just the politics, because, you know, you choosing to do research and writing on the Fed, that, that must be like the it must just feel like banging your head on the wall for 60 years or something, well, you know? Well, Having a, a career as an economist writing about monetary policy and the Fed in 20th century America. Well, well, <laughs> well I think Mises, Rothbard, and Hayek are, are good role models because they spent all their life uh, writing about the economy and uh, things have gotten worse. Uh, but I think intellectually, we're starting to win the battle, especially among young people. I mean, I teach... Um, uh, financial history of the United States, where we go over bank money and banking and uh, and uh, government policies, and students really appreciate that they're getting insights that they never saw before. I show them videos of Austrian economists and others who are really good at explaining what went on in different periods of American history, and the readings that I provide them of from the Austrian school and conventional uh, economists. And when we put it all together in the classroom, they have a perspective now that they never would have gotten if they never had my class. So it's a slow process. I wish I could have a class that fills MetLife Stadium of 78,000 people in New Jersey and uh, have a, a, a radio show that talks about this all the time because I did host a radio show back in the 90s when I was uh, um, uh, in New Jersey, still in New Jersey, and it, that was a great opportunity to uh, reach an audience, but it was a small radio station in northern New Jersey, uh, but having a national syndicated show would be a wonderful opportunity, but doing a podcast like this is um, fairly inexpensive to do, and you can reach a lot of people if you have uh, uh, a nice following like uh, Joe Rogan and others who have uh, huge audiences. So again, we now have an opportunity because of the internet to reach people, not only in the United States, but all over the world with our ideas about liberty and uh, free markets and uh, individual rights. So I think from that sense, I'm very optimistic, but the point is uh, the average person is not involved in politics. The average person just wants to lead their life, run their business, and uh, have a good time and not worry about the craziness that goes on in Washington, D.C. Now, during your, your talk today, uh, for your speak for a sandwich and then here in this discussion too it seems to me that you sort of tread the line between let's call them the monetary doomsayers right who see hyperinflation and destruction uh, by the Fed of the economy or maybe of America itself right around the corner you know so get your your freeze-dried ice cream stored up or whatever so you can live uh, in the apocalypse in comfort and then people who say that well you know the the Fed is not the economy. It's not the productive basis on, on which uh, we enrich our lives. People do that kind of stuff anyways right. without, without ever considering monetary policy. And the world's just going to keep on keeping on despite all of these policy failures, however consistent they are. Um, so uh, how do you resolve that kind of tension that this certainly is a destructive system that – fritters away wealth, yeah. and yet things do seem to get materially better year to year to year, certainly decade to decade. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, the thing is, it's a delicate balancing act of what you as an individual should do to protect yourself from the, quote, the debasement of the currency. Um, I've benefited from the Fed's policy because my 401k has done quite well over the last 30 some odd years since I've been investing in the 401k as a college employee. So that's the good news. The point is, if we have another downturn, uh, that 401k could be a 201k because uh, asset prices could, go could be cut in half like they were in 2007 to 2009. And when you're a retiree, you certainly, and you're living on that money and your asset uh, base goes down by 50%, that's a huge uh, sh um, blow to your, uh, to your standard of living. So that's why uh, when people ask me what to do, well, uh, again, the prudent thing is, uh, as Warren Buffett has said recently, the average person should just invest in the S&P 500 index fund. It's a low-cost fund, virtually 
uh, virtually no fees involved since the uh, big investment companies have been competing with each other to get uh, uh, investors' money, and so the fees are close to zero. And you just ride the cycle up and down for the for uh, your lifetime, and hopefully from the time you start in your 20s to the time you're retiring in your 60s or 70s, that thing has increased because of um, the Fed has been pumping money into the system for decades and decades. So the question is, how long can that process continue? And that's the $64,000 question that even I think Austrian economists don't know. How, how long can fiat money, central banking, continue before you do get an apocalypse, Armageddon financial crisis? And that's why it's prudent to have some gold and silver as part of your um, uh, net worth. It's prudent to have some cash, some dollars, uh, uh, out of the banking system. It's prudent to have uh, some cash reserves in the banking system and uh, allocate your resources so you, um, so you can ride the wave of the, of the stock market. So um, th- there's no single way to, to uh, protect yourself, but uh, when I first learned about this nearly 50 years ago, I said, I'm not going to get involved in all these crazy speculative um, activities because uh, it, it's going to be destructive of your of your uh, financial well-being, so that's why I've been fairly prudent in, in my investing uh, uh, outlook, and it's paid off so far. So uh, I'm hoping that um, I'm smart enough to uh, reduce my exposure to the stock market when it looks like the stock market is going to be headed south, and possibly in a big way. As I pointed out today, the next downturn could be a 60% decline in, in the in the S and P 500 which would uh, not be unusual given how big this bubble has been since 2009 when the Fed started inflating like crazy. Now, I've heard plenty of people say, especially back in those 2008 campaign days, oh, well, somebody like Ron Paul just wants a gold standard and he hates the Fed because he wants the value of his gold to rise so much, which is completely ridiculous. And obviously, those people don't understand sure. what's going on here in the policies that that uh, they were talking about. But it does make me think, I'm, I'm a historian and my specialty field is Jacksonian America. And Jackson has this great reputation among classical liberals for killing the bank. But as it happens, the reason he killed the bank was mainly so that Democratic Party activists who controlled the state banks had greater uh, greater leeway to lend for their own speculative adventures, right? So that they could have a bonanza with the banks at the state level that they controlled. And the, the Bank of the United States uh, kept uh, sort of a, a conservative uh, check on the amount of notes that state banks were able to issue. And that's why the Jacksonians killed the bank, so that you know their own cronies could sort of enter the field uh, without competition being limited by the the national bank. And uh, I wonder, do you see any of that out there today in the kind of coalition that might be forming for a new monetary system? What kinds of risks are there in replacing essentially an old aristocracy yeah. with a new one? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, Again, if we look back at what money should be, and that's really the key issue, money is not a creation of the state. Money has, has evolved historically from, from trial and error by market participants, buyers and sellers. So we went from barter to uh, using some intermediary, some which has all the qu- uh, qualities of money, uh, scarcity, homogeneity, uh, durability, all the things you find in the textbooks. And so what did the market participants uh, uh, decide on? They decided on gold and silver because they have all the requirements or the aspects of, of, of money, characteristics of money. Paper is a money substitute. So in the old days, you'd bring your gold and get a, a receipt for it, known as a bank note or a, a, a demand deposit. And so the challenge today would be what would the, quote, value of the dollar be if we went back to a gold standard, and certainly would be more than the official rate of $42.22 an ounce, it would, it would have to be some sort of um, uh, uh, analysis of how many dollars are out there that should be redeemed with the gold, and how much gold that the Federal Reserve holds, which is 250 million ounces, and that would be the ratio of uh, what the value of a dollar would be. So it's not the value of gold, it's what the, what the, um, what the ratio is of dollars to gold. 
And uh, I did some very quick calculations years ago, and I think the number was like $8,000. It's just a lot harder today since the Fed has been inflating like crazy. So it's probably $10,000 or more is how many um, dollars it would take to be backed by uh, gold that the Federal Reserve owns. So this is a more of a technical, uh, monetary technical uh, discussion that uh, people smarter than I can figure out. But that's my back of the envelope calculation. And so that would mean that the Fed, the, the Fed couldn't inflate anymore, or the only way you could create more dollars is if it got more gold into uh, the banking system. Or do we need a Federal Reserve? Uh, could the banks operate under sound monetary conditions, which means, and this is a debate among Austrian economists as well, is fractional reserve banking fraudulent, as Rothbard and his um, supporters uh, claim, or is it uh, fractional reserve banking uh, uh, an option for banks and depositors would uh, realize that, that there's risk involved because the fact that we have FDIC insuring bank deposits, federal deposit insurance, means that the bankers know that they're operating under a very shaky system where if people come and withdraw their money, the banks don't have all the money in the vaults to support uh, the withdrawal of all of the depositors. So again, these are technical aspects that should be discussed openly and um, uh, and reach a consensus about money and banking that would, would give us a sounder banking system and, and avoid the manipulation of interest rates, which is really basically what the Fed does these days. Uh, checks can clear either through a, 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 an institution like the Fed or a non-Fed institution like we had during the Suffolk system before the Civil War. So again, these are issues that can be addressed uh, uh, with people with um, uh, uh, knowledge about how banking should work. But the bankers, uh, we have to remember, created, wanted the Federal Reserve because they knew that they couldn't operate under fractional reserves without a central bank because of the tenuous nature of, of the banking uh, system. So again, um, as long as the current system does not result in an implosion, we can continue, I guess, for a long, long time, which we have. I mean, the Federal Reserve has been around for over 100 years now. So can it be around for another 100 years? I don't know. The question is, the key thing that I recall when I first started learning about this more than about 50 years ago is the whole system is now based upon confidence of the, and trust of the people in the banking system and in the money. Once that trust and confidence goes away, then it's checkmate when people decide to either withdraw their money from the banking system or foreigners decide not to buy our treasuries and uh, don't want to hold dollars any longer, then who's going to buy all this stuff? If the Fed starts monetizing it, that's when the people who claim there could be hyperinflation could kick in as the Fed monetizes trillions of dollars of debt and, uh, and uh, other securities that are out there. Remember, Japan Central Bank is now buying stocks. We have not in that the Fed has not done that yet. What if they start starting buying stocks and they start creating trillions of dollars of new money? Uh, then um, we, we could see a run on the dollar. It, it is, to me at least, sounds like a multi-level marketing scheme where the person in the middle of the tiers has realized that we're not actually selling a product here. We're selling confidence in the scheme, you know? And so the, you're given the choice, well, do you either do you want to admit your failure and how stupid you were in getting involved in this speculation in the first place? Or do you want to just sort of keep buying back in and hope that you're not stuck with the bag at the end? It's, it's like the uh, uh, card game. Um, what was that card game called um, with the uh, the old lady or what do you call it? Um, about that, where you get stuck with the card at the end. Old maid. The old maid. Sexist. A yeah. Sexist card game. But, but the point is, this is where it comes down. Do you want to hold dollars that are depreciating, like in Venezuela these days? Mm -hmm. um, th that's the danger of a fiat currency, is holding the currency that's depreciating so rapidly that, um, as we saw in Germany in the 1920s, it becomes so worthless. People are throwing it into the, uh, into the fireplace to heat their homes because the money is, is totally worthless. So that's the that's the ultimate danger of a fiat currency, and we have enough examples of history in the last hundred years where that's happened in pretty sophisticated countries. I mean, Germany after World War One was a pretty sophisticated country. Uh, we've seen it in Argentina, Brazil, uh, now Venezuela. We've seen it in African countries. We've seen it in China after World War Two, Russia after World War One. So hyperinflation has been the experience uh, in many Western industrialized democracies 
in, in the last hundred years. Now, what would you say, so I imagine that there are plenty of candidates running for office right now, for high office, who uh, like to think of themselves as an, an Andrew Jackson-like figure who's you know out there doing the people's work for their good and all of this and going to be their champion before the big bankers and the big businessmen and all of this. Um, and yet they don't seem to, to be too cognizant of the fact that the, our government-run banking system is clipping coins and, and wealth out of people's pockets like the, the, they're Roman emperors or something, yeah. that this whole system establishes and enshrines an aristocracy of money in place uh, and power and privilege pull and access through the government and through the, the Federal Reserve System. And uh, I, I don't hear anybody trying to really address that factor here, that this creates a veritable class of privileged and wealthy people at the expense of everyone who uses dollars. Yeah. And uh, that seems to be something that you really want to focus in on here in this book and in your work moving forward. Well, that, that's why people really don't understand the Federal Reserve and the structure of our banking system and how the bankers are the major beneficiaries uh, of, of the Federal Reserve's uh, interest rate policy where they manipulate interest rates up and down and the bankers um, uh, support the system because they know fractional reserve banking is unsustainable in a free market. It's just, it just is. That's why banking is the only government, uh, the only uh, uh, sector that has government insurance widespread. No other sector has government insurance. Why? No one's asking that question. It's a very simple question. If banking is structured so well, why do we need a government backup for the uh, insuring the deposit? Because of the Great Depression. That's when the people took the uh, took the banks to task and started withdrawing their money. And we saw clearly the banks were what unsustainable. And that's when Roosevelt came in with FDIC. In other words, we were on the verge of ending fractional reserve banking until Roosevelt established the FDIC. So again. Government intervention perpetuates the problem of, 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 of uh, easy money and, uh, and it creates uh, continuous inflation. So it, it, it's a very steep learning curve because very few people are uh, informed about this. That's why I write letters and op-eds in the local paper that reaches several hundred thousand people when I, I write it, and hopefully more as it gets posted on various websites. So the opportunity to express my views, which is not my original views, but basically uh, standing on the shoulders of giants of Karl Menger, the principle of economics from 1871, we're coming up to the 150th anniversary of his book, Mises, 1912, The Theory of Money Credit, uh, Rothbard's work in, in the post-World War II period, and others from the, the Mises Institute, IHS, uh, Fee, and other Cato Institute. All these people have been writing great stuff for, for decades, and Unfortunately, it's not getting to the average person. And so that's the challenge I think the free market sound money school has is how do you get these ideas to the average person? And uh, I think I'm trying to do my part in my little corner of the world in uh, northern New Jersey. And uh, this is a great opportunity to get the podcast out. So, And that's why I wrote the book. Hopefully um, this year the book will um, gain traction and people will read it. Because it was written for the average person in, in a layman's term to see how money banking evolves and how uh, Fed chairmen have, um, have uh, misinterpreted or either deliberately or not deliberately because they have a view of the banking system that uh, perpetuates this uh, Boom bust cycle, and that is where we are today. We are in the everything bubble, and the question is, when does it pop? I think it's going to pop um, after the 2020 election. Far be it from me to end this show with some sort of rousing call for today's Americans to wake up and remake themselves more like our Jacksonian forebears. Take it from me, the world's had enough of all that. Jackson and his supporters certainly deserve some kind of praise for killing the Bank of the United States, but many of them did it for their own purposes, expanding or consolidating their own power in other places now that their big enemy was gone. And now we have the Fed, which undeniably, once again, still sucks. But for God's sakes, let's allow it to die a natural death, with no Jacksons left standing 
to aggrandize himself in its ashes.